Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to today's webinar, Fresh Ideas for Recruiting Hidden Talent. Today's presenters are Mark Hamill, Sarah Goldberg, and Emily Muckin. And this is essentially a revisit of a topic the four of us worked on a while back in August. Um, due to some technical difficulties, we've decided to bring everybody back and we're gonna kind of continue the conversation. I'm really excited because sourcing moves fast. We've all grown a little bit since that last conversation. We've actually got some new directions that we want to go off into today. Um, today's webinar has been made possible by our friends over at Jim, and we're joined by Zoe Wren from their team. Zoe, it's great to have you here today. Thank you so much for partnering with us on this topic. I know you have some information to share, so before we get started, I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Josh. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Zoe. I'm so excited to be here today and to hear our great panelists, Sarah, Emily, and Mark, do an encore on how to reimagine approaches to sourcing and discover the talent other teams may be missing. Gem is proud to be sponsoring this webinar as we strive to be great partners with enterprise talent acquisition teams and empower them to engage their entire talent network optimize sourcing efforts and build high quality talent pipelines. Um, I do have a quick video to jam to show you and then we can dive right into the discussion. Um, if the video piques your interest and if you would like to learn more about Gem, please feel free to request a demo or contact us at sales at gem.com. Thank you, Josh, feel free to take it away. How long does it take to hire a data scientist? I wish I had more qualified candidates. How are we tracking against our diversity goals? Sound familiar? You need GEM. Quickly build talent pools. Reach out and automate your follow-ups. And manage your entire pipeline. GEM shows which candidates need an interview, an offer letter, or feedback from an interviewer. And real-time insights to help you plan for the future. Need to know how many hires you're on pace to make this quarter? Or your offer accept rate? Or how about your pass-through rates at every stage of the funnel? Yeah, GEM can help. GEM works with the tools you use every day and has the security you expect. Did I mention users love GEM? Cultivate better relationships and hire more quality candidates with GEM. And we are back. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. So uh, by the end of the day today, we will send out an email with a link to today's recording. If you have any questions for today's panelists, please use the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, please note that there's a chat area and there's a Q&A area. The chat area is great for, well, chat and general discussion. And then the other area, the Q&A tab, is great for, for questions, if you have specific questions for our panelists. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, let's get to it. I'd like to start off with some quick intros if we can. Um, Mark, you and I kind of started this webinar process together and then brought in other people. So I'll just, because this started with you, I'll start with you, so. All right, I like the sound. Uh, by the way, I like how Zoe called this, <clears throat> excuse me, how Zoe called this an encore. I, li I like that. Uh, anyway, I'm Mark Hamill. Uh, my name, yes, is like Luke Skywalker, only spelled differently. Uh, I am currently with a small startup company called Amazon, uh, but I've uh, actually my second tour of duty with Amazon. Uh, I was there for about four years before, <clears throat> worked on a ton of different things in the tech field, uh, went to the artist formerly known as Facebook uh, for about a close to two years, uh, and then just rejoined Amazon uh, about four months ago. Feels like a lot longer than that, kind of like in dog years, you age over there, I think is what the, the saying is. Uh, but yeah, I've been in tech built my whole life, lucky enough to be a part of this amazing community and Love, love learning and sourcing and uh, geeking out in that regard. So that's the, the quick and dirty on me. All right. Appreciate that. Thanks for being here. Uh, Sarah, uh, I ran into you at SourceCon. Hello. Um, yeah. We actually was... broke bread over at a Thai restaurant. It was pretty awesome. Uh, tell me yeah. about your background. It was was great seeing you and seeing everyone else who was at SourceCon. Yeah. Um, I miss those like, just like, 
casual encounters of like, oh, hey, yes, I've seen you in real life. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, so my name is Sarah Goldberg. I'm a talent acquisition sourcing manager at the New York Times. So my team supports our tech product data, data science world. Um, I've been at the New York Times for two years as of yesterday. Uh, it's my work anniversary. And so excited to sort of talk through you know, the ways that you find people maybe off the beaten path um, and, and get in touch with folks. And yes, uh, shout out to anyone else who's at SourceCon in person in Seattle this week. Awesome. And Emily, uh, I got to meet you face to face back in June at Talent 42. You were one of our best speakers at Talent 42. So thanks for <laughs> contributing there and thanks for contributing to our webinar program and for coming back for the encore presentation of this topic. It's awesome to have you. Well, I love second chances. And what people don't expect about me is that in my real life, I'm actually pretty shy and introverted. And so I am leaning in to any opportunities to just get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. If you've read or watched Brene Brown, maybe that resonates with you. But as far as an intro, my pronouns are she and her. I'm a senior technical recruiter at Reddit. I've been there just under three months and uh, what else would be interesting about me now that you know that I have a fear of public speaking? Um, I've only been in tech for, I think, less than four years on the recruiting side. And um, I'm enjoying working with some brilliant people. Um, and if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll also uh, get some insights onto some things that are really unique about hiring in tech. And I'm excited to dive into this webinar because we had to really learn a whole new skill set. Hiring for niche tech talent in particular is um, has taken every tool in my toolbox and I'm constantly refreshing what works, especially as social media continues to evolve. So that's me. Making sure my mic is on. Um, what you're saying really resonates, I think. The, uh, the quest for talent has uh, only gotten more difficult, I think. So, um, there will be tears, you will be tested. Um, on the last webinar, uh, I asked, and I wanna ask it again, what is one of the most unique and out of the ordinary uh, places you have found a candidate that resulted in a hire? And Emily, I'm, I'm gonna pick on you and start with you if that's okay. What's, uh, what's one of the most interesting places you found someone? I think I shared this at the last one, but it still is just gobsmacking to me. And now my story is pre-COVID but I was in downtown Seattle at a chocolate festival. Um, and I was, I was definitely feeling the sugar rush and I guess feeling a little extra brave. And um, I was sharing an Uber, again, pre-COVID, with someone uh, who I didn't know and made small talk and ended up sharing with them. I was working for Amazon at the time, hiring engineers for Prime Video. I absolutely loved working there. And it just spilled out into the conversation about how cool the teams are that I was hiring for. So I was kind of nerding out in the backseat of this Uber. And it turns out the person I was making small talk with was a software engineer at Expedia and was highly interested in the role that I was talking about. He ended up applying and interviewing. He did turn down our offer. But the fact that just from making casual conversation, he made it all the way through the Amazon interview process and got an offer. Um, any current or former Amazonians will know that that was just incredible and exciting. And I stayed in touch with this person and kind of made a, a quasi virtual friend. So that is my story. Um, what about you, Sarah? You're on mute. I should have a shirt. This is your two, yeah, honestly, two and a half, three years into a virtual um, work, and I still mess up. Um, so I'm going to go with a different one that I think I said last time, but also just a really fun one. Um, I like I like playing around with just like what you can see, not just like now, but like the internet really is forever. So this is something that I love to do when I have time, and um, was pretty successful at it. Um, going through and finding like mid-level engineers. So those people who've got like three to four years of experience are some of the hardest to hire for in my experience when you're sourcing, because there's just not a lot of the places where you're like, oh, who's speaking at conferences? They tend to be a little bit more experienced. And a lot of the people who are attending meetups tend to be like brand new. So going through those like intro to Python, 20, okay, so 2017 is now probably like seven years of experience, but or six years of experience, I can do math. Um, but like, going through and saying, okay, 
four years ago, where would this person have been? Would they have been going to this meetup group? Would they have been attending this event? And then just like tracking them down. Um, sometimes you can like cross-reference using like seek out, uh, but you can definitely do it annually with just some, you know, elbow grease and Google um, tracking down where people were from a couple of years ago and then reaching out. Um, Cause especially if you can get your hands on an old attendee list or sometimes gold. And I'll hand it over to Mark. Yeah. <clears throat> um, real quick, I want to mention, Emily, I read <clears throat> an article that said the two biggest fears that people have in, in, in their biggest fears, I'll leave it at that. Number one is public speaking. Number two is death. So people are actually more afraid to speak in front of people than death. So they'd rather be in the casket to give the eulogy. That's always stuck with me. Anyway, uh, for me, so I, I can't remember what I shared last time, uh, but mine aren't as cool. I don't have any cool stories with sharing an Uber with somebody or the old, you know, meeting somebody at a bar and getting them a job. Like I don't have any of those cool stories. I mean, for me, the, the most outside the box, I guess now with everything being open to sourcing from, I don't think it's too outside the box, but there's, there's three, but the, the top one that comes to mind, um, there was a project we were working on at, at one of my previous companies where um, it was a pretty niche role. I think that's an overused term, but it was pretty niche role. And the, we were looking through different like uh, areas where people are like posting about the topic and things like that. And then one person said, oh, I, I bought this guy's book because uh, he wrote an article and something and then told about his book that he published on the topic. And it was on Amazon. And so I went on Amazon Books. And I found the art, the art, the guy that wrote the book reached out to the guy, told him about the book. I loved it. We're also hiring, turned into a conversation, you know, candidate, conversation, conversation into hire. And it was great, but that's not too outside the box. You can think of like your example of, of going in an Uber or somebody, but for me, uh, the person that actually authored one of the books on, uh, on Amazon was one of my, it was one of my first uh, hires in that, that team too. So it was good. It's fun. Uh, Emily's story represents to me is just the, I think it's, what is it? ABR, always be recruiting. I mean, just always be representing your organization, always be, cause, cause you just never know. Um, you never know. Um, there was a question from the chat. Um, and I don't know, does anybody here have top secret clearance experience? Have you worked on any jobs for, and that's okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, this is for Austin. Austin, I'm going to drop his LinkedIn, I don't think he's going to mind, um, into the, the q and I suggest reaching out to Tom Weiner. He is awesome. Uh, they do a lot of uh, DOD type of work. Uh, he's super friendly. Um, he's a speaker from the SourceCon community. So Tom might have some insight for you there. Um, and so let's just keep moving on. And I am recycling some questions from last time, but we did have some technical difficulties. So there's, there's a method to my madness. Um, I wanna ask about silver medal can candidates. And, and that came up at SourceCon actually quite a bit as well. You know, we can't, we're in the no business essentially. We have to tell a lot of people it, it didn't work out this round. Um, so how do you manage that? Uh, how do you feel about uh, maybe rediscovering silver medalists? So maybe it was a different recruiter on your team, or maybe it's your own silver medalist. How do you approach that? Where do you, how do you re-engage, rediscover these candidates? How do you, how do you manage that process? Uh, I'm sorry. I have to go once. It's like the wild west. Uh, Mark, um, you, oh, or Emily. Okay. Thing, oh, no. thumb war. Which, who's going first? Emily, please. <laughs> I actually won a thumb war um, this last weekend. Uh, and a, so anyway, without digressing too much, um, <laughs> I had a lot of success hiring sil silver medalists, um, both with Amazon and then Netflix where I was previously. And I try not to make it too complicated. Our lives, our jobs are hard enough. And so I, I would just uh, use reminders built into the CRM. They usually have them or uh, I like a good old Outlook calendar reminder with a link to the list that I want to follow up on um, or what have you. So, um, and then looking at old recs and seeing um, if people are dispositioned properly, um, seeing who made it to the final rounds. Um, also, another tactic more than just, you know, where can I find these silver medalist candidates in my CRM or my applicant tracking system 
it's if I'm hiring, let's say I'm at a company for, you know, only six months and I have these silver medalist candidates and maybe, you know, we've told them no or not right now. How do I keep them engaged without losing my mind? Because I'm going to be following up with a lot of candidates manually uh, and I don't necessarily have the time or bandwidth to do that. Um, another thing that I've done is added them as a connection on LinkedIn. And then I post there really consistently. I try to be diligent about continuing to post not only things that represent my own point of view, but to continue to talk about why I love the teams I'm hiring for, the company um, is treating me really well, that kind of thing, to keep those candidates sort of warm and engaged in a very easy and scalable way. So I'm still sort of top of mind. And if, you're, if I reach back out, say six months, or a year past their interview, whether they didn't pass the interview or they were a true silver medalist where we just went with someone who was slightly more qualified, um, they're a lot more likely to respond. And I've, I've gotten comments through the years now of like, oh, hey, Emily, yeah, I've been, I've been loving your stuff on LinkedIn or, hey, that post was really funny the other day. And I didn't have to manually reach out and email all these silver medalists to keep them warm. I found a much more effective and efficient way to be top of mind with them by just using uh, social media that way. So hopefully that that made sense. Mark, it's your turn now. Oh, uh, You're the silver. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> you covered most of it. I have a little bit of a cold, sorry. Uh, you covered most of it, but the biggest thing for so with, with Amazon or even the companies I've been at prior, um, which are larger tech companies, most I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but most individuals don't land an, uh, an offer on their first attempt of interviewing. So most of the time, the silver medalist candidates are soon to be gold medalists. I mean, th those are something that I, I don't, again, don't have the numbers, but I do know like most of our, our hires are from people that are trying a second or a third time. So to Emily's point, you really, I mean, the key that we can have as sources of recruiters is to just be as empathetic and continue to lead with like, hey, this is something we want to keep the lines of communication open because you burn that bridge once, those people that are usually going to be there for the second time around, that's not happening. So the biggest thing is leading with empathy, coach as much as you can, but just keep like that warm and engaging line of communication with them because that, that's the key. So for us, silver medalist candidates, I guess if you want to call them that, are probably one of our biggest sources of hire. Uh, so yeah, keep that that uh, relationship as strong as you can is, is my advice. Outside of, and Emily covered all of it, but that's my advice outside of that. Yeah. And if you happen to be, um, like I've been on a ton of different ATS systems in my day. Um, I'm just like sort of thinking like, not just even like, it's great if you can just say, hey, here's this tag for silver medalists. But sometimes you do need to like take that step to, oh, you know, two years ago, we weren't thinking, how do we tag this person as a senior, as a silver medalist? Someone might not be at the company anymore. So like thinking about the ways that really strong feedback shows up. I mean, hopefully your system tracks like, okay, yes, this person got five out of five on the technical acumen part of the interview. But if not, like really loved this candidate, like loved speaking with them, like keywords like that. If you happen to have a searchable ATS, um, I know back when I was at an agency, I made so many placements just by like going through notes of recruiters who weren't here and seeing who they loved. Because um, all of this data is just there for the taking. That's a great idea. Um, and if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, where'd you find this candidate on the ATS? Uh, <laughs> 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 it's like, that's a good first place to look. Um, and a lot of people forget. Um, I want to pivot a little bit because um, I want to talk about Boolean and, and we're just, we're fresh off a SourceCon event. And I think the, the sourcing world has evolved so much, um, you know, a while ago, the sourcing title didn't even exist as a title, right? Um, what are your thoughts on Boolean? And um, I think there's we're starting to evolve. So there's two, there's two schools of thought where some people are saying, you don't even really need to know Boolean to be an effective sourcer. Uh, whereas there's other people that would say, you still you still need to learn Boolean. Um, and it, and it, we were talking before the webinar started and it kind of reminded me as a kid when you're working on some hard math problem and you whip out your calculator and your teacher says, you're not always gonna have a calculator in your pocket. Um, you know, so where, what are your thoughts? Do we, do we need, still need to learn these kind of, uh, are they archaic skills? What is it? I, I studied ancient Greek. I will say Boolean is not archaic. Um... But I, I, I'm old school, I guess. I love Boolean. I, every day, I probably do, like, I don't even want to put a number on it, but I am constantly 
writing searches, editing them, adjusting them, looking through the logic. Um, it's something that I'm really, really fond of, um, and especially just like weird operators on Google and other systems. You know, um, I probably use like in title and text more than I've used like just like a normal Google search. Um, Do you have it? Okay, wait. You mentioned weird operators. Do you have? Are there a couple that come to mind that you think we might not know about that we should be well, aware? Of? Um, so this one, I, I feel like we were talking about it a lot a couple of years ago. It's like, I don't know what it's called. It's the dot dot operator. It's to do a range. Um, we are now trying to get, you know, half of our hires to be in-person hybrid in New York. So using that with zip codes and finding yes. resumes that hey, say, hey, I live in Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn, Bronx, somewhere where I'm commutable to, to our Manhattan office is something that I've been using a lot of to actually get folks who are um, local. And so how are you, how do you know what range? Of oh, I just, I Google it. Like, so I'm in Chicago. So um, every single Chicago zip code is between 60601 and 60699. So you can mm -hmm. just do like, write your search the way that you normally would. Um, do something to like look for a resume. So I'll use like a file type PDF. Um, and then, you know, 60601 dot dot 60699 any resume that has a Chicago zip code on it will pop up and you can find lists. Like I don't, I usually just Google, you know, Manhattan zip codes and go through them. Um, and you do need to do like the full five digit zip code, but um, it's a fun, fun thing. Um, recommendations to learn better Boolean as an actual book that I actually like a physical, actual thing. Um, Jan Tegs, a full stack recruiter. There's a, I think a newer version that's purple, um, but the way that he talks about it is just absolutely, uh, it is worth the money. Um, Emily mentioned some Boolean builders that she uses. And I think Mark, do you use some Boolean builders too? <clears throat> yeah, uh, to Sarah's point, uh, I could not agree more with you. Like I'm a Boolean nerd, but I do understand where Josh is coming from. Like there's a shift, like the analogy of the calculator and math test, like that's a real thing. Like I, I remember I was in an interview uh, a while back and they were asking me like some basic, like, can you write a string for this and this and this? And this? Or that's what they asked me. And I was like, well, my approach typically I'd go to like, it was higher tool at the time and I would use their Boolean builder and type in these words and it would build it for me, but I can do it. The point is like you said yourself, sir, like you're constantly shifting and manipulating to get different results. Like I feel as though we can use these tools, which I can share plenty in the chat here in just a minute. I have a few teed up, um, which are calculated on a math test. They build a Boolean for us with the keywords that we input. But to know the basics or to know the actual like the syntax or kind of how you're building the Boolean and be able to manipulate that if you're getting different results than what you're hoping to get, those are the skills you need to have. So I'm always a fan of learning Boolean. I don't think it, and hopefully it will never go away. I don't see how it could, uh, but at least learn the basics, but then go ahead and use these calculators on a math test. But again, I'll share some of those for sure in the, in the chat here in one second. I wanted to add on to that as someone who was recently interviewing as a recruiter, I was surprised by how many companies are still like they haven't updated their recruiting process necessarily to current skill sets. And so just don't be surprised because a lot of us have been in the mix and there's a lot of churn right out now out there in recruiting in the market. And so whether or not you're, I mean, I would say have a few simple Boolean searches prepared for those interviews, especially if you haven't written one in a while and have a tab open to put some search terms in during a recruiter interview, because whether or not you use it, that may be baked into a company's recruiter interview. So, um, and I also, as far as the topic of discussion, I have more focus on sourcing and I've had many sourcing only roles um, in my recruiting career. And even in those times, barely ever used Boolean, but just knowing the concept of how it works and basic search terms are really important because even if you do go to use a website to build your Boolean string for you, you still kind of need to have those foundations of here's how it works and here's why your string may not be working or it's coming out funky. So I am just, um, I have a little dyslexia and so, which makes it sound very cute. It's just a little dyslexia. Anyway, I struggle with typos and so Boolean builders help um, combat uh, erroneous boolean string so that works for me but there's my 10 cents on it and then i'm guessing if you plug everything into a boolean builder and then it spits out that output 
it's going to educate, you're going to start learning kind of the formats and the patterns and different ways to put it together. And then you can start, you know, swapping things in, in and out yourself. So I think it's a great place to start. Um, I'm going to talk about some other things that I thought were maybe fading out, but maybe they're fading back in. I did see, I think I saw a pair of bell bottoms at SourceCon. So I guess bell bottoms are coming back. And um, somebody showed a word cloud or something like that. And I thought word clouds were kind of an old school thing, but it really, I had an aha moment because they pulled, they, I guess they dropped in like 10 resumes or something into this word cloud. And, and, one of the words that surfaced to the top very quickly, if you don't know what a word cloud is, you kind of dump in a lot of data and it makes this like this abstract thing of like all the most most prominent words. And so somebody had done a word cloud with, uh, you know, five to 10 resumes and development was like a top word. And I think that's admittedly, that's a word I would have missed. I might type in developer or developing, but like development was one of the main words or used this language or or things like that. So these word clouds can kind of help you unpack that. Do you have any other hacks uh, that might help us see through some of these blind spots or help us build better strings or, or come up with better keywords that we might not think are so obvious? Yes, this just came up with a hiring manager because he was really stuck on, I'm hiring for this backend staff engineer for JavaScript script containers and they need to be fluent in you know, JavaScript, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I do my thing, I'm out there, I'm searching and, you know, hitting, hitting a wall. We've been doing interviews, this and that. And he said, well, actually they, as we started having a conversation, I was like, what are other languages that somebody could be proficient in that would still be successful in this role? And so he gave me other, he was like, oh, anyway, during that, it's my bad. I did sort of a, a half job of the initial intake on the role and um, ask the hiring leader, you know, more specifics of what they'd be looking for, which technologies this person would be using, not thinking as much rookie mistake of like, what are what are some trans transferable, translatable, transferable skills or technologies that someone might be uh, proficient in or using. Um, so that opened up when he was like, oh, well, they could they could know Rust, they could know TypeScript, they could know this, they could, oh, cool, okay, awesome. So I went back and had a much, you know, once once we'd looked at the ideal candidates with the ideal keywords, um, it just opened things up by asking what other search terms from the person who's actually going to be making the hiring decision and doing the interviews. So anyway, word to the wise. Um, and then I think we were talking about this right before we started the webinar, but also going to the people who are doing the job that you're hiring for. So if I'm hiring a uh, backend staff software engineer to work on JavaScript containers, whatever the heck that means, is there anyone else at Reddit who's doing that or something similar? Can I talk to the person in the role to understand what are some ways that I might search for them more broadly, but even search terms and like, how would I find you? What's on your resume or peers of yours? Um, I get great insights there by just getting out of my recruiter lane and asking people who are really the experts in that field of other ways that I might search for them. That's so true. And I can't remember which one of you it was when we were chatting prior to the start of the webinar, but somebody had said, you ask the hiring manager, where do you go to learn? You're actually asking yeah. the hiring manager that question. So can you unpack that for the people here? Yeah, that was that was me. Um, just seeing like, okay, what conferences are you going to or speaking at or blogs? Like the, you know, trying to figure, like from an outside perspective, you know, armed with Google, you can find pretty much anything that people want to have found and a lot that they don't want to have found. Um, but seeing like, okay, here's here's fifteen different web development conferences. Which ones are actually really good? Um, where they go to learn? Who's speaking there? And then I spend so much time down rabbit holes, um, like to your first question about like, where do you find things? Like what like hacks and tricks do you have? I just like to follow people and see how they talk to each other. Like, are you still having conversations on Twitter? Um, I know in the last one we got into like a Slack and Discord and like other um, other online communities, Reddit, um, not to talk about where, where you work, Emily, um, but sort of seeing, 
hey, here are the conversations, here are the hashtags, here's the drama that's popping up. Um, I mean, there's always, always some kind of drama. Um, but like following that and seeing like phrases and words and, you know, how people are writing on bios, um, things like that is always, always really fun. Um, one person in the chat asked if, if we're not using Boolean, what are some things, what are other methods? I would say there's there's a lot of native search when you're searching within LinkedIn or when you're searching within Facebook or, or whatever. They've got kind of their interface that you're supposed to use it a certain way. Um, and we were kind of talking about ways to maybe use um, interfaces in off-label type of ways, but maybe we'll get to that later in the chat. But um, other really good resources or tools or things like or or things like that that will help accelerate your process and will help you in areas such as diversity and things like that. Uh, quick answer to a, a shout out in the chat. Yes, this webinar is being recorded. So we will get the recording out to everybody uh, shortly later today. Um, one thing I want to pivot again, or maybe take a, a little break if we can. Mark, you brought some slides that kind of cover the trends of kind of where we're, where we're at. Does it make sense to maybe share some of that data now and then kind of sure. jump back to the uh, the discussion? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I am a over preparer and I always like to have way more stuff than I should. So I, yeah, I threw some slides together. Let me share my screen. Hopefully this is the new platform. So Josh, can you see that? We can see it. Sweet. So yeah, uh, again, being an over preparer, I wanted to gather at least some background context as to like why we should even talk about finding candidates in different areas, which we've been discussing so far. And I'm have some cool things I'm sure we'll continue to discuss today. But numbers wise, I'm a data nerd. So I wanted to think and my slide, there it goes. Um, all right, so this is gonna paint a bit of a picture of why this is important. So the population currently in the US, approximately give or take 329 million. There's on LinkedIn, which is pretty much everybody's number one resource for searching, sourcing, recruiting TA related topics is pretty much, we all go to LinkedIn first. Um, 80, 185 million active profiles in the US. So if you take out 20%, because minors constitute approximately 20.2%, you're left with 263 million addressable profiles. That being individuals that are, I mean, excuse me, out of the population, that means that uh, 263 million could potentially have a profile. So that means that if you take the 185, which is what the current active profiles are versus what it could be at 263, that's only 70%. Like you could say glass half full, glass half empty, only 70%. I mean, you feel like it could be more. So 70% of the total addressable population has a LinkedIn profile. That means, like I just said, only, I'm going to go with only, only 70% of individuals have a platform on LinkedIn. I hope that makes sense. I'm going kind of quick. The, uh, the other thing to think about is the generational shifts that have been occurring with LinkedIn um, since 2020, I know this for Amazonians because I've looked and I have easy access to it because of where I'm working, uh, that approximately 30% of Gen Z ex-Amazonians uh, ex don't have LinkedIn profiles. Now, when we say don't have LinkedIn profiles, they might actually have a LinkedIn profile, but have not updated it to reflect the recent changes, meaning it's not an active profile. So roughly 30%, that's a lot. And that's a pretty big generational shift. So then 20.4% of Gen Z on LinkedIn, like I just said, they might have taken a new job, not active, updated their profile. It's not active is really what this is about. So keep in mind, you have 70% of the market addressable, but there's generational shifts that are working against us too. Um, that's compared to millennials, uh, which is 59.1. So this right here is actually the most interesting thing to me outside of the generational shift. Um, according to Statista, easy for me to say, 80% of people in the US have a social networking profile. LinkedIn technically in this study falls under social networking. I could argue both sides of it, but it is. So that means if 88% of all people have some sort of social networking presence, but only 70% actually have one, that means that 18% aren't on LinkedIn. 18% to some people might seem like a small number, but if you think about the actual number that that equates to, it's a very large number of people that we're not even having access to if we solely go to LinkedIn. So that's something to keep in mind my thinking about LinkedIn as your primary source. I use LinkedIn. It's a part of everybody's workflow as it should be, but it should not be the end all be all um, for that reason right there, like I just showed. Uh, a couple of other things that talk about the struggles in our industry if we're tied so tightly to LinkedIn. Um, like I said, the, the 
a part of last stage was the number of the adjustable market. There's a number there that's changed and we have generational shifts, but also the response rates on LinkedIn, uh, the current industry average, this was pulled from, I think like June is when I got this, is around 18% response rate. Now, if you think about response rate, this is including accepts and declines. This is just people that are responding. So people could respond with, yes, I'm interested, or they could respond with, no thanks. That counts as a response. So that means that for every 10 people that are contacted, less than two of them will reply. And that's not to count that they'll actually be favorable. So let's say half of them decline. So, I mean, that's, you're following the trend here. The numbers are dwindling down as we're going forward with thinking about our response rates and um, active response rate. Uh, um, what's the term they use now? It's active. Uh, I can't remember the term that they use, but if somebody applies with interest, there's like a term for it. Um, to make this even more of a challenge, uh, right now, there is currently, actually, I say right now, this is like July, uh, there is 1.6 million computer science related jobs available. And they're currently, they, universities are only awarding roughly 60,000 annually. So as you can imagine, uh, the, the, the focus on technical talent is tough now and going to continue to get tougher as more jobs come out and not enough uh, people with the proper degrees and backgrounds come out. So you think it's tough now, it's gonna get tougher, all the more paramount uh, reason to find, or, or what the topic is about is finding candidates in unique places. Also, this is the part that I think really paints the picture on how tough it is to be in TA, and that is the average candidate to hire conversion ratio. What that is, candidate to hire, is when you identify them as a candidate and when the back number of when you actually convert them to a hire. So that's less than 1%. It's 0.4%. So putting that into some easier numbers to understand, every 225 that you identify as a potential candidate, only one of them is going to get hired. I, I could argue that's, I mean, that's, it, I, I don't, I, I would take those numbers. Like, I feel like I identify a lot more than 225 for some jobs, uh, but that's numbers that are published. So if you think about this, this is, this is not easy. Like we have to find a lot of candidates and we have to find them in the right places. And then we got to hope that we can get them all the way through and these numbers actually equate to what we're trying to do. So very challenging. And to make it even more challenging, uh, there was a recent study that was done that said roughly 20 emails per week come to top technical talent. I mean, I would argue it's more than that. Like recently there's been some shifts, but I know even for recruiters, there was a hot market for recruiters earlier this year. I mean, I was getting easily that many myself and I wasn't, I wasn't top tech talent. So I would argue to say it's probably a little bit more than that. Um, yeah. So this number we've already talked about a little bit, but 75% of us use LinkedIn as first attempt. Um, <laughs> it's challenging. We'll put it that way. So all the more reason why we definitely need to all focus on finding candidates in different places. Uh, these are several that I think we all should start looking at a little bit heavier. Uh, for those of us in the technical industry, I mean, GitHub has 83 million uh, profiles, GitLab's 30 million, Slack, they measure theirs in daily usage. So it's 10 million daily profiles. Discord has over 140 million profiles. So for those of us that are tied to LinkedIn and only LinkedIn, um, there's lots of other avenues out there. So again, that's me, the overprepare, wanted to bring some data. Uh, and that's kind of a good little pause moment there. So I hope that was fun. Thank you so much. I'm trying to get unmuted here. It's like taking a double click. <laughs> um, but you, you brought really good data last time. So I just wanted to make sure that we incorporated that into this discussion. Um, we're getting some questions in the chat as well uh, that I want to address. Um, one person asked um, about successful tips on sending messaging on LinkedIn, um, which is a little bit related to a question that I had queued up about um, kind of your cadence and timing and, and how many times, because I think part of successful messaging is not just crafting the perfect message, but it's how many times do you reach out to a candidate and how many different ways? Um, I mean, I know this isn't a surprise to anyone here, but a hire is not made in one message. Like there's not a single recruiter out there. that's like, I sent 10 messages. I got 10 responses and made 10 hires said no one ever. Um, <laughs> so can you unpack some of your processes? I can get super specific. And the only devil's advocate that I will moment that I'll provide to what you just said, Josh, was working for Netflix. I did get 10 out of 10 responses. And it's not that all of those folks would get hired, but I have never in my life had a hundred percent response rate pretty much every time. But that was the power of the brand and they're known to pay top of market to tech people. So that helped as well. 
anyway, having said that, it is possible dreams do come true. I'm no longer there, though. <laughs> I'm back in the land of, you know, maybe 20% response rate on a good day, um, including some no's. So, um, you know what? I, my mind just went in another direction. I want to make sure that I'm answering what we were talking about specifically. Sorry, I have a cold, too. Um, oh, you were talking about specifics as far as response rates. I will, or follow-ups. My formula, I mean, I played with this a lot at Amazon. That was the first company I worked for that had the tools available to really measure um, the effectiveness and how many times you should reach out optimally and that kind of thing. And then I also went with customer anecdotes, you know, candidates who were going, hey, you reached out to me six times. What are you, a stalker? And so my general guidance, if you're new to recruiting personally, is generally I'll send about four total messages. Um, this is very broad. And um, I've also played with time in between those to the initial message and then the, fo the three follow-ups. So four total um, with those follow-ups. The first two, I might have about a four to five day window in between that reach out period, if that makes sense. And then that final fourth message that one, I want to play like a little bit cooler. That message is usually more like, hey, no problem. We couldn't connect this time. Would love to just stay in touch. Here's my LinkedIn, you know, blah, 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 blah. Hope you and yours have a wonderful holiday season. Um, and that one I usually send a little bit later, like 10 days later. Weird thing. I actually made more hires on my, it's cool. Take care. I'm, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. 10 days later, fourth message than I did on the first, second, and third. People were like, oh, I don't know. I think it partly could, could be like where I worked and maybe the reputation I had at the time. Mm -hmm. But it's like, as soon as I sort of pulled back from the intensity a little bit and was just like, it's cool. I'm friendly. If you're ever up for a chat, sounds awesome. But like, hope you're hanging in there. Wishing you the best. Here's my LinkedIn that's that was like the money email and that's where i would start um getting most success so there's there's my secret formula the power Anyone of else the, the power of the takeaway yeah <laughs> and the power of like the breakup message i think charlie called it of like oh yeah here this is the last you'll hear from me um i do like i like the um and apologies if it wasn't charlie it was so much content in two days um but um Sometimes I will, and like I didn't even realize like I was thinking of this like as an outreach, but like following someone on Twitter, and admittedly this means that you need to keep like a professional-ish Twitter where you're still like a real human. Following them on Twitter and then sending them a LinkedIn message is like money. Like getting responses like that, where you're like, hey, I care about what you're saying. Not sure if this is the role for you. Um, but also I usually like I will change, I, I will change it up. Like there are some folks that I have reached out to and I'll be like, oh hey. I'm reaching out to you for this manager and analytics role and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then suddenly it's like, oh, well, we've got this director role opened up. And like, I know you weren't interested in that, like referring to the fact that you've tried before and failed and not just been like, hey, I'm going to keep on spamming you, but saying like, hey, this is a different role. Like maybe this will get their attention, um, things like that. And not just being like super, um, I don't think anyone on this call would, but like a super formulaic hey, I'm reaching out for the first time. Hey, I'm reaching out for the second time. Like trying to let your personality in through has been, has been really helpful for me. I don't have any secret sauce to add other than like what Sarah said about the Twitter versus sending other messages on other platforms. Like that's my approach is usually some initial message, usually email first, and then follow up emails and usually try from another platform that I might've found them on. Cause that shows like you've really like, hopefully it shows them that you're not just Kind of mass messaging you shouldn't be doing that anyway point is that shows like hey we have other avenues that we can approach too but i also always try to have some theme that i'm following up on from the last message if there's some repository that i wrote in the first messages that i'm calling them out on i always refer back to that like i always continue the, the same theme i don't just kind of like hey you're looking for work hey we're still interested in you like yeah i always have some sort of cadence in that regard too so but nothing to add secret sauce wise i think you guys I think you guys definitely nailed it yeah I might eat my words in five to 10 years, but texting, like cold texting, I would not do. Um, like, I I get it. I think you could probably be successful, but like, I, 
I th- it, it's like a little bit too far for me, I think, reading through it. I, uh, no comment, actually. Um, emojis. Uh, do we put emojis in, in subject lines and stuff? And does that have an impact on anything? Um, I, I And the reason I ask is because, it, again, I'm sorry to keep bringing up SourceCon, but it was an amazing event and you should go to the next one. Um, but a lot of people are using emojis and subject lines. I Maybe I'm just an old grumpy get off my lawn type of guy, but I kind of hate emojis. So like, what are your thoughts here? Um, I use them in search. Um, so I will, you know, I've, I search for like the hand wave emoji because um, that's, that's where you get like people using bios. Um, and like I will... Um, sometimes like my, I mean, obviously every candidate is my favorite candidate, but my favorite ones are the ones who like put on LinkedIn, like, Hey, recruiters to prove you actually read this, like do this thing. Um, I think those are like the only instances where I've actually ever put an emoji into an email was when someone said like recruiters put your coffee emoji here. Um, but I don't that you're using emojis as part of your search. It never even occurred to me. It's it's Unicode, like anything, yeah. anything is searchable. Um, you can use it. I don't mean to steal your flavor on this one, Sarah, but I could not agree more. I use it often, especially with GitHub. I, I keep referring back to that. But when people have their about me pages on GitHub or they call them their readme, their profile readmes, it'll be a little wave emoji to show like, hey, the, the, the common thing used to search for that uh, a profile would be like, hey, I'm, or hello, I am, but also they use the wave emoji. So yeah, that's an example. Like people put that in their profile. So it's something great to search for. Could not agree more, Sarah. Sorry, sorry, your, sorry your flavor on that one. We just wanted to back up that it's awesome. I would want to say, just use your best judgment. Like don't have a reach out that is so peppered with emojis that you look like a doofus. <laughs> um, so use them judiciously. Like when I was, you know, reaching out to folks about rules at Netflix or at Amazon Prime Video, like a little popcorn emoji in the subject line, super cute. And also kind of reinforced the, uh, ad- adjectives fail me, the realm that I was sourcing for. Um, also, when I have tested it and measured it, typically mo- millennials slash maybe up to elder millennials and below respond better and don't really think twice about emojis. And sometimes depending on the role and the level of experience, if I'm reaching out, and this is a very broad generalization, but when I measured it, when I'm targeting maybe a principal software engineer with 20 years of experience, I even got comments, but generally a lower response rate. So it helped with some of the less seasoned talent and the very, very seasoned talent was like, what is this a job for kids? And you know, like, ah, like, ah, ah. so, um, to Josh's get off my lawn <laughs> persona, it <laughs> you may just want to think critically like, is this the right industry to use? Like, I see here in the comments, too, is this the right industry? Is this the right? Mm, we never want to like age discriminate, but like, is this going to be effective and perceived positively by the audience that I'm targeting? So sort of a, a yes and no for me. It depends on who I'm targeting. Memo in the chat is is mentioning Tiffany's presentation at SourceCon um, that mentioned emojis. I popped in for a second, but that was actually during concurrent sessions going on, so I missed it. I'm gonna have to go back and check out the recording. Um, and that's something that, you know, for those of you here that were not at SourceCon, we'll have the recordings up on the ERE Pro website, uh, probably within the next month or so. Um, so that's a good place to uh, subscribe to some content if you're interested in catching up on what happened at SourceCon. Um, Mark, do we can we dig into bookmarklets a little bit, or does it not make sense to do that? Um, sure. Yeah, because we, we talked about that earlier today, and I just think it's such a useful tool. I know we can probably get into deep water pretty quickly, but if we can just kind of touch about it, touch upon it, because I, I love it. I know Glenn has talked about it too. I use them all the time. <clears throat> yes. Easiest way is, let, let's do this. I will show an example of a couple of them. Oh, well, hey, let me share my screen first and then I'll show an example of a couple of them. Um, and then I'll explain like what it is and why. Uh, okay. Why is this? All right, take two. Is this working now? Yes. Sweet. Hey, look who it is. Uh, yes, bookmarklets. 
So the short version, oh, you know what? I was actually making, this is perfect timing. I was making a internal training on, which I can share because nothing special, bookmarklets and of course my office meme. So a bookmarklet, what is a bookmarklet? It is a, it, well, this is what it is, is definition. A browser bookmarks that executes JavaScript based on, or uh, instead of opening a page. So let's put it this way. If you wanna do some sort of action, um, I think LinkedIn would be our best example. Uh, let's go to Emily's profile. So an example of a bookmarklet, do you see on, oh good, you do have lots of text. You're a recruiter, so of course you're verbose. Um, it see how it says show more, like on a profile, you have to click show more. That's a bad example. Uh, here we go, better example, show more. And then it, it expands all the text. Like that's an easy action to take, but you have to repeat it over and over again. Whereas like a bookmarklet, there's a bookmarklet for like a LinkedIn expander, for example. All you do is you just click the bookmarklet and it expands them all for you. So then you don't have to go back and forth. This one's freaking out. You have to go back and forth and click all those each time. So you just go to the page, click the expander, it opens well for you. That's an example of a bookmark. It's like an automation of some format is one way to think about it. Um, there's bookmarklets for like photo searching. This is a meetup scraper that Andre Bradshaw made. There's a bookmarklet for a powerful search, which is like, it searches all the main, I'm not gonna do it because it'll open 20 pages, but it searches all the main browser. Uh, Oh, that one's five. Um, there's like, you can sort tables, you can do word counts, like Josh was talking about the word clouds. Like if you go to any page <clears throat> and you just highlight specific text, or if you don't highlight anything, it'll default to the entire page. And you click that bookmarklet, it'll pop up with a little thing. I'm not gonna do it because there's a lot on here. And I'll say this, the most common word was this, the second most common was this. So like, if you're looking at a lot of profiles and you start to do that and you see words that are popping up that aren't in your string, might be worth adding, like Josh talked about development. So that's what a bookmarklet is. That's a super quick example, but what, like they're very easy to install. It's just like, I think I might actually have an example when we can just install it live together so I can show everybody. Um, yeah, let's do this one. Let me bring this over to the screen. So we have like our keyword density checker, similar to what I just talked about. Oh no, we don't want that one. Uh, I already have this one, so it's not going to work properly. Um, bookmark analyzer. I think this is one. Yep. So this is most of the pages when you find them. Um, we'll just have it down here, and it's as simplistic as dragging it to your bookmark bar, and then you click it, and then there you go. This is an example. You could use this on any page. It'll tell you keyword is the most common used word, which is kind of funny because. I guess it's a keyword checker, but that's what a bookmarklet is. And that's the easiest way. And a lot of pages where you find them will have these. So there's that. But if you don't have that, typically it'll say like copy and paste this, this bookmark in general in Chrome. You just click the star, it'll pop up. So you can name it what you want to name it. And the URL is where you put in the bookmarklet. So let me just show what it looks like. Edit. See how this is a bunch of JavaScript. You just put that as the URL and that'll make your, your bookmarklet. The, there's endless avenues with these and Glenn, uh, well, I don't know if I have his page on here. Point is there's lots of didn't come prepared with a list of them, but I can send Josh, if you want a list of the ones that I have and just like a link to save them and anybody can have all these. I mean, it includes everything from like, I like to multitask and being that I like to multitask, I'll do something else while something's reading to me. So I use this read aloud all the time where you just click it and it reads what's on the page to you. That way I don't have to like sit there and read and do something else because uh, I'm scatterbrained like that. But like I showed the density checker, the LinkedIn page expander. Um, there's a bunch of GitHub ones I use all the time. There's like green grabbers. There's this combiner, which is a whole bunch of them in one. The whole theme with a bookmarklet is really, these are actions that we can do and know how to do. They just do it for us. So it frees up time and allows us to be more uh, <laughs> that's right. We have more time in the day, I guess I could say to get back and do what we want to do. Does that make any sense? Did that just confuse everybody? I think that was a good overview. And I mean, it's, it's a lot to unpack kind of, uh, we wouldn't be able to give it justice in five minutes, but, um, I think it's a really useful tool that people need to be paying attention to. I think custom search engines are also kind of another thing that people should be uh, paying attention to. And that's not something that we can just jump into in five minutes, but, uh, 
I think everybody's being asked to do a whole lot more with maybe fewer resources. So we've got to find ways to take back our time and to, to be more effective. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to, to ask was about scalability. Um, what are some ways that you are able to scale some of your processes and just have more reach? Um, Batman had a really interesting session at SourceCon about the different personas of recruiters. Uh, he said that there's words that we're not supposed to use anymore. Um, like post and pray is a phrase that we're going to, we're going to phase that out. Um, and, and, and having, you know, strategy shaming other searchers for how they, they do their searches. Um, we're going to stop doing that as well. So there's a lot of different ways. You've got people that are doing really high volume stuff. We've got people that are doing more batch stuff. We've got people that are doing more tailored strategic searches. Um, but with all that being said, like, what are some ways that you're scaling? Are you using web scrapers? Are you, uh, okay. Um, Emily, what I'm going to just, I'm just going to turn this conversation up on its wait, head. Is that the phrase? Anyway, upside down. So, yeah. So I especially had to lean into this hard, this thought of like, how do I scale out my efforts? How do I get more efficient? Because the volume of work that I had and the expectations that I had as a recruiter at Amazon were frankly shocking to me. They were very high. And so, and I really liked my job. I wanted to keep it and so, and do a good job. So having said that, I thought, well, okay, I don't, don't want to and can't as a single mom of two kids, just work 24 hours a day. So how can I be more effective and efficient? And so enter the age of the influencer. I could do all this work, you know, hours to find all these names that no one else has and all these cool tools and 75 different doodads and extensions and all of that. Or, and I'm not taking away from everything we've covered in this webinar, but can you also augment a space that most people aren't occupying, but the way people are making decisions and finding opportunities has changed so much, even just since the pandemic. I mean, look at TikTok. People are buying stuff based on like what an 18 year old on TikTok is recommending. And the same for LinkedIn. Um, and so as far as how to be more effective, how to be more efficient, think about how do people make decisions? How are they influenced to make decisions? now versus a couple years ago? And should I spend all day long hunting for the needle in the haystack? And maybe that's what you're doing right now in your field. But if you are working on maybe some generic roles or some high volume, can you um, just think about how to also build your influence? Because I could get a LinkedIn post that maybe gets 10,000 views and people start referring their friends to some roles that I have open and I didn't even have to reach out to those folks. I posted something earlier this week um, and I can't remember what it is now, but it wasn't even really work related. Some, a software engineer saw it who works for Meta and has a lot of awesome experience, DM'd me and was like, hey, Emily, I love what you have to say. I'd be interested in joining Reddit. Hello, that was pretty cool. So I think for us in the sourcing field to start to think differently and more modernly, that's not a word, um, about how to effectively engage candidates without having to just hunt for them one by one. That part's still there, but maybe adding to your strategy too. And scene. Anyone else? I was just gonna say templates. I use templates. Um, I like. I still. I personalize every message I send, which I know I'm very lucky to be gold on how many people get back to me and not how many people I reach out to, which is, I think, like the most important thing. Um, but templates, things that I use a lot, saving things, documentation, just being able to be like, yes, here we go. Let's, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. Oh, uh, it's been really helpful. Yeah. To, to Emily's point, I love that. For, for me, it, it's a lot of efficiency tools. Like there's the source of recruiters we copy and paste and type the same things repeatedly, like text expander that Emily just put in there, bookmarklets, things that I can rinse and repeat for other areas that will eliminate time I had to do in the, like if I do it once, I don't want to have to do it again. If it can be reused, that's usually my methodology. But to the point of like scraping, I, I scrape uh, data all the time, but it's not the actual like ability to scrape the data. That's simplistic. It's what you do with the data. Like you need to clean and comb the data. And then what do you actually do with it is what really takes the thought, uh, or at least you need to be able to know what to do with it to that extent. So, um, 
I echo what everybody's saying, but yes, I do scrape data quite often. I just, we got to comb it somehow. I have a few more questions, but we are out of time. Um, I thought that this might happen. There was so much great information here. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for being here today our, to our panelists. Uh, you took time out of your busy schedules again and came back to, to have this conversation. Um, huge thanks to the team over at Jim. Um, we interact with a lot of uh, different vendors and sponsors, and they're just, uh, they're absolutely an incredible organization. And I think they're one of the organizations that are absolutely moving the needle and adding a lot of value to the TA community. Um, of the teams that I know uh, that have implemented Jim, I've never heard a single, uh, they just, their praises are sung far and wide. And so if you're looking for ways to make your processes a little bit more, not a little, a lot more effective and, and, and to manage these relationships with, with talent. Uh, you owe it to yourself to book a demo uh, with Jim because they're absolutely phenomenal. So I'm so glad that Zoe was here today and, and helped us put on this, uh, this presentation. Um, quick announcement. Uh, those of you that were at SourceCon probably heard this. Um, it was a bittersweet event. Uh, Tanji is passing the torch. Uh, it is time for the next SourceCon editor to surface from the community. I was going to say, I don't know what I was going to say. Community is the right word. Um, <laughs> but we are, we are on the hunt for our next editor. So if you are interested in, uh, in being a part of that, uh, there's a really good opportunity here. Um, folks that are interested can email uh, David Manister. I just dropped his email in the in the chat. So David at ere.net if you'd like to either recommend somebody or suggest yourself as a possible person, uh, it's time. Um, and so, without any further ado, uh, we're gonna we're gonna break. Uh, everybody here that was on the webinar expect to see them at upcoming conferences, Talent 42 and SourceCon and the like. So if you want to meet anybody here uh, in person, please keep your radar uh, active as we announce future events that are that are coming up. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your continued support of the program. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to bring this to a close. Thanks, everyone.